Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Well, all of you asked and we listened. Sustainability is an initiative hitting product development like a ton of sustainably sourced bricks. Today, we're kicking off the first of a three-part series we pulled together to cover ways your company can employ modern tools to tackle your sustainability initiatives. My name is Sophie, and I'm on the marketing team at, here at EAC Product Development Solutions. And today, we're presenting sustainability regarding material reduction, presented by one of our application engineers, Stephen Prelly. A little housekeeping. Uh, before we begin, if you have any questions during the presentation, please do not hesitate to type them in the chat as we will make sure to get them answered. Um, we'll also have time at the end for questions. We'll also be recording the session today. And so pending any technical difficulties, we will be sending out a replay of the webinar following the session today. I will start off by giving a short introduction of EAC, and then I will hand things over to Stephen. At EAC, our mission is to help companies design, manufacture, connect to, and service their products. And to take a look at some of our products and solutions that um, our service spans the complete product development lifecycle, including computer-aided design, simulation, additive manufacturing, product, service, and application lifecycle management, technical publications, IoT, augmented reality, um, we're a leading premier PTC partner offering the whole PTC portfolio as well as leading global solution provider for over 20 years. We also have partnered with Formlabs and Intamsys to offer 3D printing lines to address your additive manufacturing needs. We offer multiple service offerings to help manufacturers achieve their business goals with a focus on process optimization and the digital thread. So this includes business assessments, training, migrations, extensive technical support, engineering and design services, and honestly, much, much more. We are headquartered in Minneapolis, Minnesota, but we have employees spread across the entire US. So we are within reach and ready to help no matter where your business is located. So that's just a little bit about EAC. Now I'll hand things over to Steven to talk more about how our solutions can impact sustainability initiatives through design. Go ahead, Steven, it's all yours. All right, thank you, Sophie. So today for our agenda, uh, for our webinar, we'll start out with an overview of sustainability. We'll be talking about what sustainability means, some of the problems with manufacturing today, and some of the solutions and benefits of focusing on sustainability. And today we're gonna to be focusing mainly on dematerialization, which is the first part of our three-part webinar series. Uh, we'll be talking about some, some tools in Creo for dematerialization. And then we'll end with a, a short demo to focus on some of that technology. As we may know, discrete manufacturing must change fast if we want to serve our needs without sacrificing the needs of future generations. And because of this, industry today is pushing for a more sustainable process for companies around the world. At first glance, uh, improving product sustainability appears costly and risky, but the truth is that it is a huge opportunity for us. We've learned from our customers and our own science-based program that sustainability has far more upside than downside in our companies. In our world today, there currently is a problem in the way that we manufacture, handle materials, consume energy, and handle waste. Our demand for material is exceeding the Earth's capacity. More than half of the global energy consumption comes from manufacturing and production, production centers. And right now, only a small percentage of that waste and scrap is actually being recycled. However, all of these problems are certainly worth solving. The majority of companies today are getting on board with more sustainable purchases. Employees are looking for jobs that have strong environmental goals. And companies with environmental programs in place are seeing an increase in shareholder value, as well as proven revenue increases year over year. With that being said, more sustainable products will help businesses win more contracts. Sustainability will drive margin efficiency with earlier design optimization and will also help to mitigate risk in an increasingly constrained world with problems with the supply chain, with uh, regulations that we, we constantly have to abide to, with resource limitations, investor pressures, and much, much more. What most companies and most employees don't actually understand is that 80% of a product's environmental footprint is determined by design decisions. So these footprints are contained in 
greenhouse gas emissions, hazardous materials, and landfill waste. And these, these can all be addressed earlier on in the product development process. Throughout the life cycle of our products, from materials to manufacturing to waste management, we have an opportunity to optimize our design to be more sustainable so that we can contribute to a more sustainable world as well as win more business. In the case study on the screen here, we can see that Cummins, a PTC customer, have challenged themselves to create a more sustainable and more prosperous world. So what they did was they set quantifiable goals for the entire company for 2030, as well as longer term aspirations all the way out to 2050. To handle this challenge, they've integrated a few different things. They've integrated requirements man management, they've adopted um, simulation driven design, and are fully integrating emerging technologies into their design process. And by doing this, they were able to reduce right away the total material that they use by 10 to 15%. And here we have a quote from the Director of Design Engineering from Commons, uh, David Genter. He says, we're taking very seriously the amount of material that we put into our designs and the amount of water that is required to manufacture them. Given that most of the CO2 footprint is determined within an item's design phase, if you don't utilize generative or you choose a suboptimal material that can't be recycled, reused, or remanufactured, that ship sails very early in the whole design and development process. And I couldn't agree more with David here. So for the rest of the webinar, uh, we will be focusing on some PTC tools that help with sustainability, specifically with dematerialization. So today I'll walk us through some of the benefits of simulation-driven design, generative design, and additive manufacturing. We can address the goal of simulation-driven design with Creo Simulation Live Extension. So as we use more sustainable materials, as we use less materials, we need a way to quickly analyze how that affects our design in regards to its application. So Creo Simulation Live is super easy to use. It's incredibly fast, which gives us access to things like virtual prototyping, encourages us to use simulation earlier and more often in the product design process. As product designers and engineers, we can leverage Creo generative design to ensure that we are building optimized parts within a certain uh, design criteria. Generative topology optimization will take these application loads and constraints and automatically give us and generate for us a lightweighted version design that's optimized for performance. Generative design extension will help us to decide which design is best in terms of how we want to manufacture that part as well. So we'll be going over both the generative uh, topology optimization and we'll be talking about the generative design extension as well. So CSL and generative design can certainly help us create sustainable designs, but how can we produce these products and prototypes? And that is where Creo Additive Manufacturing comes in. So Creo Additive Manufacturing Extension will help aid users by adding functionality for automated lattice structure geometry, as well as optimize their printer tray setup for producing um, 3D parts, prototypes in a more sustainable way. So we have a few live demonstrations that we're gonna be walking through today. And the first one I'll start with has to do with Creo Simulation Live and additive manufacturing. So we're gonna actually take a aircraft bracket and we're going to create a lightweighted iterated design for that using CSL and lattice structures. We're then gonna switch gears and um, create a generative design using topology optimization. And for this example, we'll be using a race car seat bracket, and we're gonna be exploring several different manufacturing methods for this, talking about the generative design extension and how we can choose the most optimal and sustainable design. We are then going to take that same seat bracket and we are going to set that up optimally and most sustainably for 3D printing using additive manufacturing. So with that, I will go ahead and change over to Creo here. And here is the first part that we're gonna be working on today. So this is actually an aircraft bracket that I have here. And you can see I have an annotation that says our stress goal is to be lower than um, 70 megapascals for the max von Mises stress. So to get to Creo Simulation Live, we can go up to the Live Simulation tab. And in here, you can see we have a study set up that contains a couple different loads and a, and a constraint in here. 
So we have some connection forces in two of these holes, as well as a fixed constraint over here on this, on this bigger hole. <clears throat> so once we have our material selected, once we have our loads and constraints set up, we can go ahead and simulate this. And as you can see, um, Creo Simulation Live is super fast. It actually runs on the GPU of our computer. And because CSL runs on the GPU, Creo Parametric runs on the CPU, they can kind of work in junction with each other to provide us with a very fast, very interactive result. So within a matter of seconds, we have a, a simulation complete for this part. And you can see that right now we are definitely meeting our goal of minimizing that max von Mises stress to under 70 megapascals. But right now we have this whole center area filled with material. And with sustainability, with dematerialization, our goal is to lightweight this product um, to reduce some of that material. So for example, let's say I wanted to get rid of that intersection of material there. As this loads for us, it's going to spit out another result within a matter of seconds. And you can see the max von Mises stress is now around 400 megapascals. So we have to have something in here um, in order to meet that stress level goal. Now in Creo Simulation Live, what we can do is we can set up a simulation probe and I'll just choose the entire part for this. So basically what this is gonna do is it's going to save and point out the max von Mises stress of this entire part as we make these design iterations. So I will go ahead and also click on this accumulate data here. And now as we make changes to our design, we'll kind of see this in this bar graph view here of how those different design changes affect our goal or how it affects the, the max von Mises stress for this part. Now there's a couple of different things that we could do um, inside of this empty space here. But what I'm gonna do first is leverage some of the technology in the additive manufacturing extension. So we're gonna try to put a lattice structure inside of the middle of this empty space to see if that will help with our, our stress goal. So to get to that, we'll go over to our model tab and under engineering, you'll see we have this lattice option here. Now, the first thing it's gonna want us to do is define the lattice volume region. So I'll go ahead and just go around and select all of these surfaces in which this lattice structure will be contained. Okay, and once we have that set up, you can see that in the right-hand side here, we have an example of what, sing what a single cell of this lattice structure will look like. So as this single cell um, looks like this, it will be propagated and added to, to fill up this volume region that we um, defined over there. And right from here, we can change the actual attributes or change the, the properties of this cell structure. So let's say I wanted to divide this cell structure in half. I could simply do that for all three axes changing that from 70 to 35 in all directions. Right from our graphics window, we can also change the actual ball diameter for this example. So let's say I wanted to change that to 15. And we can also change the cross section size. And let's say I wanted to change that to five. So now we have a cell that looks like this. Um, if at any time we wanted to see what that propagation would look like, we can open up our little um, glasses icon over here and it'll give us a preview of what that lattice structure will look like as it's propagated through that region. Now with additive manufacturing in Creo, um, there's a ton of different lattice types and options that we can choose from uh, based on kind of what we're trying to achieve with our model. So right now we're in the beams option or the beams lattice type. And in here, uh, there's a few different types that we can leverage. We can have a more triangular shape, um, a rectangular shape, we can go hexagonal if we would like. There's an octagonal option and a few more options in here as well. Now there's also a bunch of different options for the actual self-fill configuration. So let's say we wanted to maybe add some outer trusses 
or maybe we wanted to add some inner truss beams. We have options of doing that and it automatically updates and configures that for us and then propagates that through that volume region. Now, as we have this configuration set, and again, we look at our preview here, you can see that right now we have some beams in here that aren't really um, adding anything structurally to our design. They're kind of just wasted material um, that's kind of just dangling there. So what we can do in here is we have an option for actually removing these dangling beams. So as I click OK here, it will go ahead and remove all those unnecessary or dangling beams within our model and it will go ahead and regenerate for us. And as this loads, you can see that our next iteration, so we have zero, which was the empty space in there, and our iteration one is going to be this lattice structure that we created. And we can immediately see the difference in the max von Mises stress between these two iterations. Now, right now we're at 104 megapascals, so we still have to um, configure this to maybe um, add a little thickness to these beams. So that's what we'll go ahead and do next here. So I can go back into my lattice structure, edit that definition, and let's say I wanted to change this ball diameter back to 21. Maybe I wanted to change this cross-section size back to 7. So as we make those changes, you can see we're now hitting our goal uh, of 63. If we wanted to, we could probably remove a little bit more material. Uh, but for the case of this demonstration, we're going to call this good. And again, we can see the difference in the Max von Mises stress by accumulating that data through all of our different iterations. Now, in CSL, we also have the ability to test out different materials very quickly. So if I go into my materials under my design items, I can simply just set one of these materials to our master. It will go ahead, it will regenerate, it will re-simulate um, what that looks like for a different material. So again, CSL will help us to bring simulation um, earlier and more often into uh, our design process and kind of help us to create sustainable products from the very start. Okay. So now we're gonna be talking about generative design. And generative design can help us build optimized geometry based on application constraints, as well as different design criteria. So here we have a race car seat. And what we're gonna to try to do with generative design is we're going to optimize one of these brackets um, based on the loads and constraints of this application of this race car seat here. So I'm gonna go ahead and open up this part. And we're going to go into our applications into generative design. Now, this first part that I'll be uh, showing you guys is actually the topology optimization portion of, of generative design. So there's two different extensions, uh, topology optimization and then generative design extension. And we'll kind of get into the difference of both of those. But right now, I'll be focusing on the topology optimization, which basically uh, allows us to generate geometry based on a certain um, design criteria, as well as some loads and constraints that we set up. So in this model here, you can see we have um, our design spaces defined. So first we can look at our starting geometry, which would basically be just our envelope for our entire um, geometry to be optimized and built through. Um, next, we can look at our preserved geometry. So these are the things that we're going to want to keep. We're going to want to make sure that we have this geometry included with our generated design. And then finally, we can look at our excluded geometry. So if there's ever a space maybe that we don't want any material to propagate to, or we have an interference possibility, we can set up a body for excluding geometry um, just to make sure that, that no geometry will propagate and generate in that specific region. Now in here, you can see that we have the ability of setting up you know, multiple different um, simulation um, analyses. 
So right now we have this third one active. And in here, you can see we have one force that's kind of happening on this top plate up here, and then one constraint that's happening on these, these two holes down here. Now, like I said, with generative design, we have the ability of setting up different design criteria. So in here, you can see we have a few different design criteria already set up for us. This first one has to do with 3D printing or additive manufacturing. So as we look at the um, design criteria and definition for this, you can see we first set up a design goal. And in this case, it is maximizing the stiffness while limiting the, the volume to a certain percentage. And now where these are gonna differ for different manufacturing processes, we have our design constraints. So the design constraints in this case, two of them here that have to do with 3D printing. So build direction and critical angle. Um, you can see in here, we also have ones for casting, we have ones for milling, right? So if we looked at one for milling, for example, we would have a similar design goal, but we would have different design constraints. So we would include things like extra direction, extra angle, is this bi-directional or not, and things like that. So let's say for this case of this demonstration, we wanna keep the active design criteria of 3D printing. And then from there, we can go ahead and start to optimize and generate this geometry. Now, as this loads, it's going to start kind of um, thinking and, and processing uh, the different design criteria, the different um, design spaces, as well as the loads and constraints. And it will actually start to build out geometry for us. So you can see it'll kind of go through and take a, a little bit to solve and start to build this, this geometry that's meant and optimized for 3D printing. Now this will take a few minutes. So I do have the actual um, part in a different window here. So as that loads, it's going to spit out a geometry that looks like this. And then from there, we can reconstruct that and create a part. So this is what our actual part looks like. You can see it looks um, pretty funky, but um, it's optimized based on those design criteria, based on those loads and constraints, and optimized for 3D printing. So if we wanted to maybe you know, manufacture this in a different way, it'd be pretty difficult um, to do that. Um, if you wanted to mill this, it'd be nearly impossible. Um, so we're able to generate these, these different designs um, with different manufacturing processes in mind. Now, <clears throat> with the generative design extension, if we actually go back to this guy here. So if we go back to this, um, the generative design extension is the portion where we can explore all of these different design criteria. We can compare, we can contrast, we can pull up different um, analyses for different things like uh, volume of material, like vitamin C stress, things like that. We would do that in this explore design studies option here. Now, I actually don't have this license turned on, but I will talk about it briefly in our presentation again here. So topology optimization, that's what we did in the demonstration. And again, that is where we set up, we optimized, reconstructed a part for 3D printing. Now the generative design extension, the second piece to this, the second add-on extension, is where we send all of these design criteria to the cloud. Um, the cloud will actually, there's some technology for cloud computing that will go through and analyze all of these different options for us, where we can pull up different graphs, we can measure the differences in volume of stress, material volume, um, any parameter that you may want to look at to eventually filter and compare to find the, the final product or the best solution in terms of um, maybe material, um, maybe cost of, of manufacturing uh, to give us the most sustainable, optimized product that we can have. Okay. So we talked about CSL, we talked about generative design. Um, now that we have this generated design, how do we actually go ahead and set this up for 3D printing in the most sustainable way? 
So additive manufacturing extension helps to ensure that our parts and prototypes are printed in the most optimal, in the most sustainable way possible. So from here, um, there's actually, with the additive manufacturing extension, we have an added analysis tool in here called Build Direction. So as I click on this, it'll bring up this window for us, and it, it'll allow us to optimize this build direction based on our sustainability goal. So it's gonna ask me to, to specify a build tray plane here. We can go ahead and do that. And in here, it's going to ask us some things, um, some details for the 3D printing. So the first thing was the build tray plane. Second thing is critical angle. Third is subcritical angle, minim minimal area size and overhang edge width. Now in terms of actually orienting this in the, the most optimal position, we have some options under our orientation tab here. So in here, we can specify how we want to optimize this orientation. So right now we have 100% down skin area, which is meaning we're going to minimize the area that requires supports for 3D printing. We also have options for support volume, so minimizing the actual volume of those support structures. We can minimize the area that the model projects onto the actual printing tray. And we can also minimize the height of the model as well. So we can actually slide these around and say, oh, maybe I want to focus mainly on down skin area, but I want to also have some support volume shadow area and model height introduced into here as well. It'll break this up into different percentages of what's more important. And as we click OK, it will actually build that out for us. It will build out that optimized um, part orientation within the printer um, for us here. Now, that does take about five minutes. So I have one that we've already created in here. So as we look at the definition of this, We can see we've chosen critical angle, subcritical angle, and those will actually be highlighted in the geometry for us. So the critical angle is going to be highlighted in red, subcritical angle is going to be highlighted in the sort of this yellow color here. Now for our optimization of that orientation, we decided to go with 100% of the downskin area. So we're minimizing the area that requires supports for 3D printing, right? So reducing the, the material. Um, dematerialization, kind of the whole goal of this. Um, there's a lot of ways to do it in Creo, and this is another example of that. So <clears throat> now that we have this build direction saved within our Creo environment here, we can actually go ahead and set this up to be 3D printed. So if we have additive manufacturing installed, we can go over to print, and we'll have this option for prepare for 3D printing. Now it'll bring in our part as well as our tray volume. Now in here, we have the ability to set up different printers. And if I look at my printer list, you can see we have a few different options in here. If we have a printer that runs on the materialized build processor, we can actually conduct jobs right from the Creo interface. Now, if we have a different printer that runs on a different processor, we can certainly add them in here. And um, we'll have to make sure that the the tray um, dimensions are loaded in here so that as we send this out, it will be um, sent out correctly to our printer. So right now I have the PTC generic printer selected and we're gonna keep that. Um, and from here, we'll have this option for arranging this on our tray. So we can do this automatically, but we can also utilize that build direction that we have saved against our model. So I'll go ahead and click on that and it will go ahead, think a little bit and then place it on our tray based on that build direction that we defined. So you can see it placed it in our tray from that build direction. Now there's a couple other things that come with this um, extension here. We have the ability to take measurements. We can validate our part for printability. So we can validate thin walls. We can validate narrow gaps, lattice penetration. We can also check for global interference. And we can preview this for 3D printing if we would like as well. We can actually slice it up um, with that preview. 
One thing that comes with the advanced packages is, is we have the ability to automatically generate um, support structures within the Creo environment. So if I open up the edit support parameters option here, you can see we have a ton of different options for actually customizing and configuring these support structures. So we have a, a ton of different options. I'm not gonna mess around with all of those. I'm just gonna make sure that my self-supporting angle is 30, uh, which is what we set up in our build direction. And we can go ahead, activate that, and use it for automatically generating these supports. Now to do that, of course, we would just click on the generate support button. Again, that does take about four minutes to complete. So I have an example of that pulled up and what that looks like. And you can see here, it generates those support structures for us. And it actually places them as a, another um, sort of feature in our, our tray assembly here. <clears throat> now, once we have our part our support structures all complete, um, we can actually go ahead and save this to be sent to our 3D printer. So a couple different options of doing this. Um, again, if you have a materialized build processor, you can do it right from Creo Parametric. But if we don't, we can save this as a different file extension. Now, a couple different options of doing that. I know some printers take 3MF, but a lot of them take, take STL. Uh, so for example, we'll just choose STL here. And we have the option of actually customizing this export as we save this off. So in here, we can choose and define our port height, our angle control. We can control step size for our, our tessellated surfaces. I'm gonna leave these all as default and we can go ahead and click okay. And it'll bring up what that STL file will look like, all of the different tessellations that are used in this model here. So to recap, um, what we covered today, we looked at simulation-driven design with Creo Simulation Live. We looked at generative design and creating optimal um, lightweighted products based on certain design criteria. And then we use additive manufacturing to actually set this up to be 3D printed. So all of these options are definitely tools that will help bring a more sustainable um, process earlier on in the product development um, process for us. So with that, I'll go ahead and go back to a presentation and now I'll open it up to any questions that we may have. Yeah, great. Thank you, Stephen. We'll go ahead and take some time for questions now. Just a reminder to type your questions in the chat box in Zoom. And I'll go ahead. It looks like we had a couple pop in during the presentation. Um, so I'll go ahead and read those for you, Stephen. So can you apply the things shown today to previously created Creo models or models already created in a different tool? Or do you need to start from scratch? And can you apply this to imported geometry? That was one of our first questions. Yeah, so in terms of Creo Simulation Live and, and the additive manufacturing extension, you certainly can, can apply those to imported geometry. Um, as long as the model imports correctly and it's um, um, solidified, certainly will work for CSL as well as additive manufacturing. Awesome. All right, our second question is, you may have shown this and I missed it, but were you able to see how much material was removed from the original model? Um, yeah, there are different ways to analyze how much material was actually removed. Um, you could probably figure that out in the in the mass properties. A um, couple of different ways to analyze that. Um, you definitely set up a, a certain design criteria. So as we were working through those design criteria um, uh, options, right? One of the one of the criteria was to limit the actual volume within that starting region to twenty four percent. So from there, uh, we know that that optimized model will have a volume of twenty four percent of that envelope. So that's actually something that we can control with the generative design. Very cool. All right, our third question is, can you add light weighting or Latisse fill that could be traditionally machined or are they specifically for 3D printers? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, there's there's a bunch of different types. I only covered uh, a few of them, um, but we can actually create custom 
lattice structures as well. So you can, the kind of the, the world is your oyster when it comes to these lattice structures and you can create customizations within um, what's already offered there. So yes, that is possible. Okay, awesome. Um, can the generative design report be shared or exported? Yes, that is something, there is an export option for that. Awesome. Were you able to define the factor of safety for the generated design? Yeah, so we can actually add that as a design criteria if we would like. So that's, I think it might have been included in our definition, but it certainly is a design criteria that we can add. So yes, that is possible. Awesome. And then Abik asked, could you please elaborate a little more on the differences between the topology optimization and cloud-based optimization? Is right. the cloud-based optimization more suited for trade space exploration, like identifying and analyzing Pareto optimal designs or parametric optimization, say over variable loading parameters, versus the local topology optimization being more suitable for single objective design optimization? That may have been a lot. So let me know if you want me to break it down. Yeah, no, I think that was actually well said. I think based on your question, you, you have a, a pretty good understanding. So what we did was the topology optimization. So basically taking one of those design criteria and creating a generated design from that. Now with the generative design extension, again, we, we can take all of those different design criterias, all of those manufacturing processes, send them to the cloud computing, and it will parametrically analyze them. It'll spit out results for us for things like von Mises stress, for simulation, for different analyses and kind of compare them for us so that we are allowed to um, choose the, the most suitable design. So I hopefully, hopefully that answered your question there. Awesome. All right, it looks like we've covered all the questions, Stephen. Is there anything else you wanted to cover before we wrap up? Nope, thank you everyone for joining today. Appreciate your time. Yeah. Great, yes, thank you everyone. We appreciate you being here and learning how you can use tools like live simulation, gener generative design and additive manufacturing to greatly improve your company's sustainable impact on the world.